But for our eyes to be open in this time frame, to see what's going on in this world, you know, we need to have a certain reality inside of us as Christians. The value, if I say value, value. the value of what is to be gained. You know, and, and I think a lot of times when I listen to Christians talk and, you know, they, they're still doing things in the world, and I just let them talk and they, and they reveal themselves to me type of thing. And I just think, you know, so yeah, I used to drink, I used to do some drugs, I used to, you know, smoke, and I used to do all these kind of things, you know. And then I got saved, and the Lord began to, to, he didn't take it away from me. He began to tell me how there was something else that he wanted to give me in place of it. Have I understood that? And so I could, I could never comprehend that, even as a young Christian, that if I give you my smoking, you're going, to give me, you're going to give me something greater than that feeling I have, especially after I eat dinner. Yeah. If anybody in here smoke, if you, you probably know that that was like the best time to smoke a cigarette, yeah. as soon as you finish eating. You know, now it's coffee time, you know, but anyway. <laughs> and, uh, so, and so when I gave it to him and he took it away, what I got out of that, and I can't even begin to tell you of how... It was even greater than that satisfaction of the cigarette. I mean, way beyond what I even could have imagined or comprehended. And so my point here in this message as we go along is there's a value to be gained. And some of the things that we hang on to have no value. But we just find ourselves just doing it again and doing it again and doing it again, you know? Playing the same old game, you know what I'm saying? And the Lord's just simply saying, you give me that, I'll give you something of value. And he's saying that to all the church. But here's the deal. As we come to know this truth by watching God do things in our Christian walk as we got saved in our, our little baby infant steps and God doing <coughs> things in our life, this world has progressed a hundredfold since I got saved in 1980. You know, I mean, when Julie and I got married... You know, we still had a black and white television set. And then we got a color, and we had both, you know. And now I don't even know, unless you go to an antique store, you can even find a black and white television set, you know. I mean, things are moving so quickly. This is, it's, it's moving, you know, and to, to try to keep pace with it. So the devil is constantly, constantly just throwing something that pleases our flesh at us. I mean, we all have different pleasures of our flesh and but something's going to catch your attention and he's just dumping it out by the bucket folds onto this earth you know and then a lot of this stuff costs money and so you know well a lot of it probably all of it and uh, certain places people want to go and so that means they have to work overtime they have to start you know missing church and missing the word of God and and then even though we go on YouTube they're not watching it because I know they're not and because they're too tired. So to keep pace with trying to keep up with the world, it's going to involve a lot of time. I remember hearing that the invention of computers, man. My sister was getting into it way before they even came out. They started to come out with games and stuff, little things way back when, you know. And, uh, but, but it was supposed to free us up to have more time to spend with the family and all. I remember watching a, um, a documentary on that, and they were, man, the computer's going to free up this world. People are going to have more time to spend with their families and, and do things and everything else. Instead, it, it attracts our attention to it where we can't put it down. That's right. It's on our phones. It's on our, you know, somebody said, who was it? I forgot who it was that asked me if I, if I had a computer at home. And I went, where have we got, let's see, one, two, three. If I count the ones that are here, two, four, five, we have like six computers, wow. you know, doing different things, right? She's got her computer, I got my, my computer, I got one in a bag upstairs that I haven't even used anymore, and uh, you know, it, it still works. We got one in that nursery, we got one in there, one right there. I even got a dead one that's in my computer. It's not really dead, I actually can, it's got Windows 10 on it, but I used to have it back there. You know, we just, we get computers and everything, you know? My phone's been so upgraded, it's a G5. And they tell you, you know, it's going to mel melt your brain, which it probably will, but I don't know. <laughs> I don't know if, if it's because of the radiation or just because it will, you, you hold it because you're on it all the time, 
Like, where's Bruce? Bruce is on the phone all the time. That it's gonna just get stuck to his ear one day. You know? Am I right? He's got like, you still got three phones? Two? He's downsized. Got two phones going off at the same time. Hello? Come and get my cards dead someplace. Amen. The value of what is to be gained. The computer is not the thing that's going to give us this free time. It's what can be gained by pushing away from it. And I mean, yeah, we use it. We need it. Got those games we have to play. <laughs> and uh, do other things on it, too. It's all online stuff. Philippians 3. But what things were gained to me, these I have counted. But what things were gained to me, these I have counted loss for Christ. Yet indeed I also count all things loss for the what? For the excellence. excellence. For the excellence. For the excellence, excellence of the knowledge of Christ. Amen. Jesus my Lord. For whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish that I may gain Christ. Now if you go back and read above it, he's, he starts to check off what he was. Pharisee of Pharisees. You know, he, he was more skilled than the other Pharisees. He was much learned. He had gained a lot of knowledge about the law. He knew the law better than the other Pharisees knew the law. And that's what ate him up with this way, W-A-Y, Jesus, the way, the truth, the life. This new way that he was persecuting the church heavily because he had... He had the, the law in him that he studied and studied, and he knew. He knew inside and out. But he missed something. The law was pointing to Christ. So all his studying, and then when the Lord got a hold of him on the road to Damascus, he said, why are you fighting me? Why are you resisting me? Who are you, Lord? Jesus Christ, the one that you are fighting. So in other words, he was telling him, I, I would imagine there's more that was even set out there on that desert, out in that desert where he, the Lord got a hold of him. Basically saying, you think you're doing God's will, but you're fighting against God. But because you have a zeal to fight against God and think you're doing his will, I'm going to cause you to do my will. What is the real will of God? And then he gave him a revelation. See, you won't find that in Acts but we, what you will find is that the Lord got a hold of him and he became blind for a few days. And, but the Lord is, has gave him a revelation and that revelation is what we read in the scriptures today in the New Testament. And that revelation took him and, and took all that knowledge of the law and dropped this one simple thing in. The law is good and it's God and everything pointed to Jesus Christ, the second, the, um, the second covenant that will be ratified through the blood of Jesus. He had already died at that point and resurrected. He was in glory. And now he had to start getting a hold of these people that knew the law inside and out but couldn't make the connection that it pointed to Christ, the Messiah. Right now in Israel, I, there's, there's these YouTube vids that are out right now um, having to do with some rabbi, got his name and all, he's a famous one, and he's saying that he's in conversation with the Messiah. He said, but I can't tell you who he is yet until he tells me that I can. Interesting. Is this real? I don't know. I just know that there's YouTube vids out there that keep updating it and, you know, type of thing. Interesting thing is that Somebody's talking to somebody who says that they're the Messiah. This is Antichrist. Well, if he really is talking to someone, that's exactly who he's talking to. Yep, you know? Right. And so, right here we see Paul going through his, um, all the things that he was and what he had learned. And then he comes and he says, all this knowledge, all this training, and that was his life accounted as rubbish that I might win Christ Amen. that I might gain Jesus Christ 
He said, and be found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which is from God by faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings, being conformed to his death, if by any means I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. Now, this is in English, but to many of y'all, it's in Greek. <laughs> it was translated from Greek, but with many of y'all, you're reading Greek because you have a clue what he's saying right here. Tell him hello when you get him on the phone. But, you know, many Christians, they might have read this stuff, but they totally miss it, just like Paul missed it in the road to Damascus. And all his learning of the law, he had no clue that the law was just a picture, a shadow, the scripture says, of things to come. Amen. And so he's now, he's going to go kill some people and arrest a bunch, bring them to prison for believing in Jesus Christ. And he gets, he gets knocked down in the sand, blinded by the light. And God understands that he had a zeal for God. He even says it in some of the scriptures that he wrote. Had a zeal for God to go and do this. And yet they were doing exactly what the, what the law said that they would be doing. They shifted from the ordinances and all the laws and now became free and liberated in Christ. Amen. The law was never designed to set a person free. The law was designed to make people humble, to bring them on their knees, to make them understand who God is. You see, it was never, it was never intended. They had to, every year, they had to keep killing some animals on the Day of Atonement and covering their sins for another year. Even the priests, in Hebrews it says, he had to first make an offering for himself. You know, he wasn't perfect like me. Nobody called. They never came. But I have to repent before, and I got to seek God and make sure that I'm clean before I come and talk to y'all. And anywhere God sends me to talk, as I go on team, to see Teen Challenge guys on the Wednesday, as I'm driving there, I'm examining myself because these guys are going to ask me questions. And well, once the questions get started in that class, they are, they are just tough, a lot of them. And I want to be able to answer their questions. I don't want to be standing up there to ask me questions and say, I don't know, I'll let you know. Oh, another question. Oh, I'll, I'll find that one out for you. Uh, no, I want to be able to answer their question and give them hope. Because many of the time I get there, they're already thinking about quitting, you know, and so forth. But many stay just because I can answer their questions. But I have to make sure I'm clean. And that's how the high priest had to do, those priests back in the Old Covenant. They had to first offer up. They had to wash themselves in pure water and then go in and do the services for God. But now, we have a high priest. Well, I don't have to do too much. I just stay connected. Holy Spirit convicts me. I repent. And then I pray before I talk to people that the message can be understood. And, and if, I'm, if I'm not clean, it's just going gonna, gonna to fall on deaf ears. Because I want you to understand something this morning about the value of of what's to gain. Now right here in this little passage of scripture, there's something, there's a bunch of things in here that's interesting, but I'm just gonna point out one, okay? Can I point out one? Yes. You know me though, you're liable to get two. But anyway, and the fellowship of his sufferings. Anybody read that before? Yes. Nobody? Yes. <laughs> Tammy read it. Who else? Yes. Oh, I know Julie did, I know Deborah did. Gene, didn't you did? Good. The rest of y'all need to read it. And you need to wonder about it. And the reason why maybe you have read it, you don't remember reading it because it, it made no sense to you, so you ran right over it. And the fellowship of his sufferings. Now let me tell you what that means. Anybody want to know? The rest of y'all, do this. Put your fingers in your ears. Because so, I'm about to say it, and since you don't want to know, I want to make sure you don't hear me. Yeah. 
I'm going to pretend I didn't see that. Because <laughs> I want to I wanna know you want to know. I want to know you want to know. So how many of y'all want to know? Yeah. All right, good deal. So nobody's got fingers in their ears. Good deal. And the fellowship of his sufferings. Now what he's saying there is this. Is that there is a gain or a benefit to the sufferings of Christ. And when I fellowship with it, or I come into learning it and examining it and walking with it and understanding it, I start to realize I'm going to be healed. I'm not in bondage no more. He was nailed, so I'm free. Amen. They beat him. I don't have to be beaten. I don't have to go to hell and be tormented. You see? He wore a crown of thorns. I can have a sound mind. Right. As they shoved those thorns down into his skull. So I can have a sound mind. You understand? In other words, as he started to learn about everything Christ went through that he hadn't, or he saw Isaiah 53, but they always ignored that. They didn't want that suffering lamb. They always would read the scriptures on the king will come triumphant and he will come in, you know, riding on a stallion and, and come and, and set Israel free and get rid of the Romans type of thing. King Jesus. But he began to understand that what, ha what had happened to Jesus on that cross had to happen. If it did not happen, there would be no benefits. You understand? The benefits. The benefits of the cross. And that's what's being said right there. That I may know him. See, he starts off with that. That I may know him. All right? And the power of his resurrection. I won't even tell you what that one means. That's powerful one. But you don't only want to know one, so we'll give you one. And the fellowship. I want, to, I want to know him. I want to know the power of his resurrection. I want to know his sufferings. And then being conformed to his death. What is he saying? See, most Christians don't have a clue what's being said there, so if they did scan it and read it once, they're not going back to this. Makes no sense. But let me tell you something. What I'm reading to you right here is the epitome of calling yourself a Christian. It's the only way you're going to be a witness out there to those dead people is for you to comprehend and understand what is being written here. What is Paul talking about? You have to have the mind of Christ. You have to have the Holy Spirit speaking inside of you to even begin. You might not see it, and that's okay. I have a gift to see it because I'm a pastor and I'm a teacher, okay? But you have a gift to understand it if you just want to. You understand? Not everybody's a teacher, so that means that, you know, you need to be taught by a teacher. One of the gifts. But I don't have some gifts that you have. And I need, you know, I need your gift. But one thing that you need to know, you know, like in Matthew 13, is the parable of the sower. And in the midst of that, he starts to talk. And the disciples, they didn't understand what he was saying. And the sower went out to sow seed. Some fell on, on rocks and so forth. And he, and he doesn't explain, but he just says it. And the disciples are like, what's he talking about? And so they say, they really want to know themselves, but they say, why do you speak to them in parables? Speak plainly that they're going to understand. And I am speaking plainly. But all they have to do, and he starts quoting from Isaiah, and he said, well, has Isaiah spoken to these people? Their hearts are wax gross, their, hear, their ears are dull of ear, hearing, and their eyes are closed. Lest at any time... They decide they want to understand, and I'll convert them. Some say, and I will heal them. It means the same thing. To have their spiritually dead heart alive, spiritual eyes open. The lady was seeing church, saw really great, and the Lord said, you need eye salve so you can see, because you're blind. You know? So these people were blind. So then, he's such a nice teacher, he turns and he teaches a disciple what he's just finished saying out loud to the crowd. Kind of teaches them in private. It's for your eyes to see and your ears hear. So he gives them the explanation. Well, the Holy Spirit's in us now. 
If you really want to know, if you really want to understand, the Holy Spirit will open up your understanding. But if you really don't want, oh, I really want to know, Pastor Jim, say, really? I'm not the judge of that. But if you still don't understand after you've been taught, then you really didn't want to understand. Now, I'm not trying to be mean. I'm just telling you what the scripture says. A lot of times, people just write off, you know, write me off. They write off all the teachers. They watch, they'll start watching a video, and then they just shut it down. Oh, this guy's crazy. Well, they thought Jesus was nuts. They went and got his mom. Come get him. And, Je and his mom shows up with his, with his brothers and, uh, and, and his sister, and he's, they're coming to get him and take him off. He's, he's insane. He thinks he's the Messiah. Woo. <laughs> That's true. And then Paul, Paul starts preaching the truth. They bring him in before a king, and the king's Jewish, and he understands everything, and, he's, and they say, he's gone mad. He said, I'm not, I haven't gone mad. You know very well, and he looks at that king, you know very well what I'm saying is true. You know very well from the scriptures that the Messiah was to come. You know he was to show up, and you know he was supposed to do exactly what he has come to do. But yet you just don't want him. You don't want to believe. And on Pentecost, Peter stands up in the midst of him, filled with the Holy Ghost. Back over here, he had denied the Lord three times. Now he's standing up in that temple, and he's telling them, you crucified the Messiah. You killed the King of glory. And then what happened? It was so powerful what he said, that the people begins to say, what must we do to be saved? How can we make this right? You need to believe on him. Amen? Amen. And he doesn't care that later on he gets arrested, he gets beat, he, goes and says, he doesn't care. Over here he's saying, I don't know him. And he curses three times. But now, it don't matter. You can beat me all you want. Do whatever you want to do. I'm not going to stop preaching this truth. Amen. Changed his life, you know? But there's a meaning in all of this stuff. Number one, as long, everybody say as long. As long. See, I do that sometimes because some of y'all look like you're going to sleep. As, <laughs> as long as I focus on this life, as long as you're focused on this life, as long as I am, I will never understand what lies before me. As long as you think this life is where it's happening. And I got to do this, and I got to have that, and I got to do it, you know, no, 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 it goes. You're never going to understand what lies before you. I'll give you, for instance, I got another scripture, but I'm going to give you this one, what's in my head. Rich young guy comes up to Jesus, right? Everybody know the story? Yeah. All right. What must I do to have eternal life? He said, man, I kept all the law. I've done this, I've done that. And Jesus didn't condemn him for like bragging. He said, you're not that far. But you still got one thing that you need to do. You need to sell everything you got, give it to the poor, and come and follow me. And he went, sell everything that my dad worked so hard for? You know, it's funny is that he didn't even work hard. His dad did. But anyway, so, so he walks away heavy laden. He had too much stuff. So Jesus just turns to his disciples and said, how hard it is for a rich person to enter the kingdom of heaven. You know? So he goes into the eye of the needle thing, you know. It's easier for the cam camel to go through an eye of a needle than it is for a rich man to enter heaven. It's not that it's that difficult. And God, only on special occasions, is going to tell somebody to just give it all away. All right? So he only said it to the one guy. There was other rich people that was following him and supporting his ministry. That's right. You know, with food and sustenance and so forth. But that's the only one that's recorded. We can't, we can't play into it. He told every rich person, sell everything you got and follow me. But that was what that young man needed. You understand? He needed that. So as long as that is, has a grip on your life, God's going to deal with it. It might not be your money. It might not be your cars and your houses and whatever. But it's going to be what you're focused on. And as long as I'm focused, as long as I focus on this life, of what I focus on, I will never understand what lies before me. Philippians 3 says, 
No, dear brothers and sisters, I have not achieved it. He's talking about, I have not arrived in heaven. I'm still dealing with my life, okay? So he said, I have not achieved it. But I focused on this one thing, forgetting the past. And boy, I tell you what, he had quite a past that would constantly bombard him. Anybody got a past that at night you're trying to go to bed or something and, you, and all the bad stuff that you've done keeps coming back, you know? He said, and he was crucified, he had people crucified. Steve, um, Stephen got stoned and he was the, the man standing there holding the coats of the ones throwing the rocks at him. All righteous people, right? And then he was going after those people and, um, to arrest them too. But getting the past and looking forward to what lies ahead, I press on. Now that's an interesting set of words there out of a Greek word, which means I have to deal with what's coming into my head. Are you with me? Yeah. I press on to reach the end of the race. Because if I don't get this stuff out of my head, I might not finish the race. I press on to reach the end of the race and receive the heavenly prize for which God, through Christ Jesus, is calling us. Wow. So, you know, this scripture here, I was a young Christian. I was only weeks old in the Lord, stumbling over the same junk, and the Lord delivered me Lord at a time. And I was about to tell the Lord, Lord, I'm sorry. I just can't, I can't stop. And the Lord said, and he gave me this scripture. And I wasn't even there yet. And I, was, I had just reached, I got saved after reading Matthew. So now I'm still in the Gospels at this time, working my way through the New Testament. And he gives me this set of scriptures. And I didn't know where it came from, but I heard it in my heart. And then he explained in my heart, telling me that Paul, Paul did a lot worse things than you're doing. He said, there's nothing recorded here in heaven. So if you've done anything that was wrong, you, had, you probably repented because it's not here. Now I heard all of this. I wish he'd talk to me that clear most of the time, but he, a lot of times I gotta go beg him to talk. Amen, you ever felt like that? But this came through so quick because I was a baby Christian and he, was, he didn't want me to walk away. And he said, repent. And then he told me how, and began to, I began to see Paul struggling with the things that he had done. So finally, it took me, I don't know how long, before I finally reached Philippians. That was way, old, way long in the New Testament. And then when I hit this, I was like, oh, that's the scriptures. So man, I, I studied this. I began to look it up in any way I could find. I had a strong concordance. I could get the definition of Greek words that form these English words here. And understand that it's saying to press on to press on, to, to not let anything slow him down. To, to throw off all those nightmares of the people he had killed. To, to say repeatedly to the devil, I'm forgiven, I'm forgiven. I listened to a song last night. I, I, I listened to a lot of Christian songs on Saturday night just getting my thoughts together. And it was one by Crowder, Forgiven. Anybody heard it? If you haven't, go punch it up in the Passion. That's where they got a lot of different singers. And he sings it on there. 65,000 people in the stadium. And they turn the camera, and everybody is looking up to heaven. Unbelievable. Not one person squirming or looking down. They, when they shot that camera out on, over a view of thousands, every one of them was getting the revelation, I am forgiven. Amen. Forgiven. Amen. He said, I should have been six feet under in the song, it says. I should have been, and he goes on. Just go home and listen to it. Great song. Press on. Push everything out of the way. You've got so much to gain of great value. Yes. Number two, as long as I hold on to something that I think is real, I will never be able to grab hold of something that is real. I'm going to tell you something right now, and you all can, uh, you can identify with this. You know, you're, you're plugging on in life of what is real, and it is real. You've got to take care of your family, you've got to provide, you've got to do all that stuff. I understand. But suppose you die tomorrow. 
then what is real is going to be in your face. Understand? It's not that the Lord doesn't want you to provide for your home, because, I mean, it says in the scriptures, if you don't work, you don't eat, okay? Right. So he wants you to provide. He wants you to take care. Somebody said, would you protect your wife if she's being attacked? I said, with anything and everything around me, because I'll have to answer to God for not doing it. So why don't you get a gun? Because I'm going to use the gun. <laughs> I'm going to kill him right there on the spot. I promise you that. I don't want to kill him. I want to give him a chance to get saved. <laughs> You know, I'm not against anybody having a gun, but you're going you're gonna to resort to that gun, I promise you, because you're training yourself to do so. So I try to train myself in the Word of God with the sword of the Spirit. And when people say something like that, what if somebody will attack your wife? I said, he's going to have to deal with me. Well, he's got a gun, he's going to kill you. I guarantee you I'll have enough adrenaline in me that I will kill him before I die. <laughs> They just laugh. Yeah, how do you know? How do you know? I said, I don't know. All I know is that my Lord's not going to allow it to happen. Amen. The Lord is going to give me what is needed to handle the situation. Well, how do you believe that? Because I, that's what I put in me to believe. Amen. You, so to other people that's not doing that, see, that sounds foolish. Well, yeah, I believe in the Lord too, you know, but I'm still going to get a gun. I said, well, you're going to rely on the gun. You know, I've been in some situations, not in that vicious, where I wasn't being threatened, but it could have turned into a threatening situation. You know, I saw in advance as I was walking in the direction of where it might have been bad. But instead, there's a situation that happened one time, instead of the person being violent, which the person was, began to cry and asked me to pray for him. So now I'm hugging this guy like this, because he's a giant, and he's crying all over me, and, and he keeps on saying, you know, help me, help, pray to God that he will forgive me. Now, it could have been a bad situation, but the presence of God was so strong. I said this testimony before, and it's popped back into my head, so I'm giving it to you. Um, a guy by the name of Mario Morella, anybody heard of him? He's, he's a minister. Now, he's, he's been in major revivals in this world, and I heard about him when I first got saved. Well, a testimony from him. He was preaching at one of the universities in California. It might have been Berkeley. Uh, one of them, anyway, they had a football team, let's put it that way. And he was heading off to go preach. Now, he's about my height. And as he's walking on the pavement at the sidewalk, these five or six football players, big guys, come walking towards him. And he's just praying. So they come up to him, and, and one of them grabs him and got him up on his toes, holding, got him on his shirt. And he's, he's, this guy is threatening his life that if he keeps preaching that Jesus, he was going to kill him. He was just threatening his life. And then they're all looking at him like that, and they're laughing at him and, and so forth. Well, all of a sudden, they got him, he got him by the shirt, and he said they all started looking up. And they looked up over my head, and he said, these guys were big, but whoever was standing behind me was bigger than them. He said they set me back on my feet, he pushed my shirt down, and they all backed off and ran off. He said, I never did turn around and look and see who it was. It was his angel. His angel manifested himself more. You don't want to deal with the angel of God. Amen. So as long as I hold on to something that I think is real, I will never be able to grab hold of something that is real. 1 Timothy 6. But you, Timothy, are a man of God. So run from all these evil things. Pursue righteousness and a godly life, along with faith, love, perseverance, and gentleness. Now watch what he says. Fight. Everybody say fight. Fight. Fight, fight the good fight for the true faith. Yeah. Hold tightly to the eternal life to which God has called you which you have confessed so well before many witnesses. Fight the good fight of faith. Grab hold of eternal life tightly. You gotta understand that that is what the great gain is all about. Because you're saved, you have heaven in your future. Eternal life. Now if that isn't great gain, then what is it? There's a lot of stories and parables Jesus taught, but one had to do with a pearl of great price. A man sold everything to buy that pearl. 
because it was of great value. Let a guy find treasure in the field. And he buried it back and went off and bought the field because of that precious treasure he found. What have you found of any value? Eternal life doesn't mean too much to some Christians. I mean, I'm not only saying from what I see and observe because of what they're doing and what they're saying and what they let come out of their mouth, eternal life is meaningless because they still haven't learned this value yet. Amen? Amen? Amen. Have, you, have you learned the value of eternal life? Let me tell you, it costs something. Amen. It costs the death of your Savior on the cross. Amen. He turned his face to the smiters and he uttered not a word. And it says in the Hebrews, it says, for the joy set before. What joy? What joy was that for what he went through? It's the, most, it's the most horrible way to die that they say is crucifixion. And for the joy set before him, he endured the cross, it says. It was so, it was so strenuous for him, about, and he hadn't even went into it yet, that he's in the garden and blood vessels are popping and his blood and sweat is pouring out of his brow as he's crying out to his father, if there's another way. But let me tell you right now, it wasn't that he was afraid of the cross. Because you'd have to prove it to me because there's no scripture that, that tells me that he's saying, if you could remove this, was a fearful act of that cross. Because he already knew he was going to that cross. But what he was about to experience was more traumatizing than the cross itself. And that for a little while, for, for just an instant, he was going to experience. He was going to experience separation from his father. And on that cross, he said, Psalm 21, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And there was an instant there when the sin was laid of us on him, and it blinded him that his father was right there. Because if you go on and read Psalm 22, you see what the Lord did not leave him. The songs out there saying he turned his head away. He was in Christ reconciling the world back to himself. Amen. But he was about to lose sight of his father when the sins of the world, your sins and my sins, was laid upon him. And it only lasted but four moments when he said, into your hands I commend my spirit because it is finished. Amen? He was in total control, even on the cross. Total control. Yet, for just a moment, he got disconnected in his thinking, in his sight, from the Father. In other words, his total focus and total stuff of the world that Paul is writing to Timothy to run from, those things that we are told to run from them, that was laid on him. So, the cross was the price. And if you lose the value of eternal life, I don't know what to even say. I've run into prodigals. And that they know me, they start confessing. You don't see that. <laughs> I told you one time we was at Texas Roadhouse. It was, and she was at one of those ladies things once again. And so I took Jason out there. We went to Texas Roadhouse. And they had a guy that was sitting on this side of the church. He came a few weeks. And so this, this person in a wheelchair was going out the doors, and we were heading out too. Just so happened that guy was there. I didn't even recognize him because I, don't, I didn't remember what he looked like. But he had been drinking at the bar, and he was drunk. But he recognized me. So he spotted me somewhere in there. So he's standing right next to me as we're trying to get out the door. And I'm trying to assist to get the real child. And he's standing next to me. I'm not even paying him mind. And he starts confessing. Pastor, just pray for me. <laughs> Who are you? I've been to your church. And he's drunk. He's just drunk. Pray for me. I know, I, know I, I shouldn't be here and I shouldn't have been drinking. I, you know, we're standing in the doorway. People are piling up behind us. Wheelchair's now out. We haven't moved. People are trying to get around. And he's still confessing. I said, wow. I said, I will pray for you. So we got out. I said, let's go outside and pray for him outside. But 
had to let the, had to let the traffic jam out. I didn't recognize him. I didn't even notice him, but he noticed me. I went in, we went in one time, Texas Roadhouse. We hadn't been in a long time because I got off the bread and the bread was fabulous. But anyway, uh, and then we went in and we sat down and right over here was this minister friend and I didn't know, I didn't see him at first. And uh, so I sat down, well he had a beer. Not that I care if he had a beer or not, but he had a beer. And he caught sight of me and then Julie saw him, and I, I turned right and I saw him, and I got up and went and said hello. He did not touch that beer the whole time. And when he got home, and I don't know when he ran into Ivy, but he told Ivy, saw your pastor at Texas Roadhouse, he caught me. <laughs> I said, he caught you? What do you, what do you mean? He said, yeah, he, he had a beer. He, I said, yeah, and he didn't touch that beer the whole time I was there either. I felt like going over to him, just drink the thing, man. <laughs> But he wouldn't drink it. It was just funny. Amen. Oh, now I didn't even know how I got on that. But anyway, I get, I get moving. Let's get back on track. <laughs> Somebody needed to hear it, I guess. Fight the good fight of faith. Amen. Wow. Hold tightly to eternal life. How many of y'all been hurt before? Been hurt? Got some hurts that you're just really struggling to get through? Amen? We all go through hurts. We all have things that have happened. Some, some worse than others. Some hurts is actually lost loved one, the person that, that dies. We have a few like that that we know. And some have just been hurt by another person or whatever. It doesn't matter, but you've been hurt. Let me tell you something right now. And I don't want to say... Just get over it. That would be, I'd hurt you again. <laughs> now I got to get over the pastor. But I would never, I, yeah, I would never say something as dumb as that. But I will say this, that if you, if you would investigate eternal life, you'll be much easier on your hurts. It'll help you to forgive. It'll help you to, to move on in your life. If you could just grab hold and understand the value that you will gain from it. All the benefits of the cross, it's all for your taking. Amen? Amen. I don't have an answer to heal your hurt except Jesus. Amen. He is the only answer. He has healed all my hurts. I hated my dad, you all all know that. And then I got saved and I didn't found out I was supposed to love him. That was hard and God helped me to do so. But even though I fell in love with my dad and I led him to Christ and he's in heaven, I still, I still don't like him. Because the Bible never tells you to, to like anybody. It just tells you to love. Amen. Amen. But I still have scars from my relationship with him. Number three, as long as I stay in my comfort zone. I mean, y'all know what I'm saying when I say comfort zone. All right. As long as I stay in my comfort zone, I will never know what his suffering was all about. Wow. You know, when, all right, let me give you uh, something up top of my head. My comfort zone. Now, your comfort zone is something that you can't get away from. It's, it's the way you find your comfort. Well, he was nailed to the cross. That was his comfort zone. Gee, what kind of comfort zone is that? In other words, he was bound so you can be free. You understand? You can be free. You know, you, you, just, you just have saying things, I can't do this, you don't understand. I can't. Say, no, I don't understand what your problem is. I hardly understand my problem. But it's just a human problem. It's just a way of thinking that you have formed into a comfort zone. You make people stay away from you because you say things to keep them at a certain distance from you. It's your comfort zone. That's what it is. It's where you're comfortable. When people get too close, you, get, you start to shake. You, you start saying things and get more harsh to back people off. I do it. That's why we only got 10 people here this morning. <laughs> I, have, I have had to learn 
how to expand my, my comfort zone. Jabez was a guy. I'm going to give you scripture in a minute, but Jabez, anybody know that name? Yes. That's an interesting guy. You can read about him in um, what, First Chronicles. And uh, it's, God's, it's like God's call and roll. And, and I forgot what chapter it is, but and it's gone through the, uh, the tribe of Judah. And it's, it's like he's hitting the names. And then he hits in Jabez, the son of, okay? And all of a sudden, it, it's like he steps forward out of line. And he says five things. He just says, Lord, bless me indeed. He says, broaden my borders. You know? And, and he goes on to actually make this request, and he steps back. Well, God, after, every time I read that chapter, it's like call and roll. You got all these weird names, right? This one begot that one all the way. But when Jabez is there, it's like I see it in my mind, like they're all lined up. God's call and roll, and Jabez steps forward. And then it says, and Jabez was more honorable than his brethren. Amen. Amen. Now you go, you go and do a little study, Hebrew. I'm not, I can't even pronounce Hebrew words. But I can look them up and find out what they mean and so forth. Because our English translations, they, they use a different English word all the time because they, gotta get, they, they would never get a copyright if they used the same ones. So they're using different ones, but they're all, you got to kind of bunch them all up to get an understanding about what, what's being said here. And so what I see is happening there is that Jabez is saying, I am tired of my comfort zone. Amen. Broaden my borders. Now, he's not saying, let me, let me jump over the fence and get out here and deal with the wild animals. He's saying, let me move the fence out. Yeah. You got to understand, yeah. I dealt with my comfort zone to be able to talk to people, not by jumping over the fence of my fears, but by moving the fences out. Amen. I'm still in my comfort zone, but it is a million times bigger than what it was. Yeah. I had to drink to even talk to a crowd even a third the size of this. But now I'm in the Holy Spirit and I drink of him, the living water. And I can talk in front of, it doesn't seem to matter. 3,000 was in the stadium and, and I, was, I think about that many, or 2,500. And, and I was able to get up and talk. I was a nervous wreck beforehand though. Because all, it felt like the fences were closing in. But when I got up in front of all these people, this anointing, this, this gift of God that had pushed the fences out, and I began to, I didn't want to let go of the microphone, I was ready to preach as I was talking to these people at, at Victory about Katrina a few years back. As long as you stay, as long as I stay in my comfort zone, I will never know what his suffering was all about. Now Hebrews said, so also Jesus suffered and died. Now watch what it says. Jesus suffered and died outside the city gates to make his people holy by means of his own blood. Now watch what the writer writes. So let us go out to him outside the camp and bear the disgrace he bore. For this world is not our permanent home. We are looking forward to a home yet to come. And what is he saying? Now what he's saying He's saying that you need, you see, you haven't embraced the cross because your comfort zone hasn't reached the cross. So in other words, the cross and the sufferings and all this stuff, we, we accept it to ourselves, but we haven't learned that. Let me ask you this question. How many of y'all know that everything Jesus did was for you? Okay, now you know that. How many of y'all are living in the benefit of what was done for you? All right. You see, you got to grab hold of what I'm saying. I just asked you how many of y'all believe that what he did was for you. But now I'm asking, if you believe that it was for you, how many of y'all are living in the benefits of what was for you? You get my drift? How many of y'all get my drift? I may say it again then for the rest of you. All I'm simply saying is that you identify with the cross 
is he didn't die for his own sins. He died for your sins. All right? But you haven't moved your comfort zone out to figure out the benefits of what he went through. You know it was for you, but your comfort zone is so small that you haven't went out and experienced in your spirit this suffering and everything he went through so that you can benefit from it. He's not saying go out with him and go get nailed to a cross. That would be, that'd be ridiculous because he's already died for you. He's not saying go outside and find a cow and kill it and take the blood and throw it on the cross or anything ridiculous like that. He's saying go out and receive the benefit, the boldness, the anointing, his rest, his peace, his sound-mindedness, his healing. So well, I've been praying for the sick since had one away. Now, yeah. keep on going. That's all I can say. You, you're giving up? Is that why you're telling me? You've done this, you've done it, you gave up? I go camp out at the cross. I don't want to go back in the city. I'll bring my tent and my sleeping bag, and I'm going to sleep at the foot of the cross. Amen. And I'm going to get healed, or I'm going to die trying and be healed that way. Amen? Amen. Amen. So, you see, there's a, there's a way of thinking about what's being said. He's saying, you need to go out. Let us go out to him. Let us go see. Let us go feel. Let us touch. Amen? We told us, touch not, taste not, and uh, whatever. All is to perish with the using, it says. But we are to touch and listen and feel the affections and the love and, and what happened on that cross. So yeah, you believe it was for you, but then you're not receiving the benefits. Hmm. Amen. And I want to tell you right now, he didn't die in vain. No. He's got me yelling at you this morning. Go to the cross. Yeah. Get some boldness in your life. Get some rest in you and peace in your soul. Get some healing down in your organs. Get some wisdom on what to eat and how to eat and what to do. Get some exercise. Do, just go to the cross and see what he tells you. Yes. Amen. Exercise your faith. Amen? Amen. What does the next scripture mean to you? Philippians 1, 21 and Amplified. For to me, to live is Christ. He is my source of joy, my reason to live. And to die is gain, for I will be with him in eternity. Amen. What does that mean to you? Well, I'll tell you what that means to me. It means that the old Jim Jeffries has to die. Yes. And the new Jim Jeffries has to live for Christ. Yes. And by receiving the benefits, I began to live for Christ. So much so, sometimes I... I Start to come down on myself, and and I say things to myself like they're not even listening, stuff like that. And uh, I remember one time, and I just know quick testimony. The guy was remedi more remedial, his building, big tall guy, and his name was Kerry. And we walked all the way across the building with him cursing. And then he gets outside the building out there, and he says, "Oh man," he said, "Who are you?" He said, "It's just you know, how was, you have to do with this building." I said, "Well, first off, I own the building. Secondly, it's going to be a church, and I'm the <laughs> pastor." I've been cursing all the way through. So he stopped cursing all the way back. But, <laughs> and I had to laugh about that because I don't know if it was me. I don't know if it was God. I don't know who gave him the power to not curse when he walked all the way back. But his reality of who I was and who I am, which he didn't know, began to manifest and began to convict him all the way back. So at times I come down on myself, but I know that, you know, the Lord's going to use me and do what he wants with me when it's time for me to do it. He's not requiring anything except go to the cross. Stand on your feet, please. So what does this mean to you? For to me, to live is Christ. He is, and then amplified, he is my source of joy, my reason to live. And to die is gain. Let me ask you a question. 
Is dying gain to you? Yes. Man. Now, I understand, you know, if you're raising kids and all, you're not ready to go. And I'm telling you, you're not ready to go. So, you don't go. <laughs> Continue to raise your kids. I don't raise our kids. Now we play in with the grandkids. So it's easy for me to say that, that step into eternity is gain. I know that. But let me tell you what's even greater gain than that. You mean there's something greater than going to heaven? Yeah, it's having heaven on earth. Amen. On earth as it is in heaven. Amen. You see, in heaven, I don't have to go win any souls. The only ones that are there are saved. <laughs> but there's a lot of unsaved here. Even Jesus said it this way when he came to himself in John 14. These works you see me doing, you shall do and greater Amen. because I go to my Father. Yeah. So in other words, if you leave this, like Paul said, I'm in a straight betwixt two. It's better for me to go home and be with Jesus, but far better that I remain and teach and, and talk to people about Jesus. So as long as you're here and you're breathing, you got a job to do. Amen. Why don't everybody in this church come on up to this front here? There's a pool right here. There's a river flowing into it. I am I am on the banks of it standing here. I feel it every Sunday. Some of y'all even had visions. I think Jordan had a vision one time of a river flowing in here, didn't you? Amen. Amen. But there's a refreshing right up here. It's always I don't know why God works that way, because he can easily touch everybody from the, to the back wall. But it's something about moving, just making a move. And, and all I want to do right now is you just close your eyes for just a minute. I want to speak a word over you. Amen. And I believe with all my heart that God has a word for you as individuals. And the word changes a little bit that he has for this group. So I'm going to first start off with the young people. And I just want to, I have this word that's burning in my soul. And that word is, grow up and become a man and woman of God. Amen. Amen. Don't listen to this world. It's all right when you're playing games and stuff. But don't listen to the world because the world is trying to entrap you and trying to drag you off to hell. But my God is promising your parents, your grandparents, he's promising that he will move upon you. And so the word for you is don't yield to this world, but yield to the Lord. Now I have a word for the, the young couples that are raising children in this church. You know, some of them will have to definitely get the video so they can listen. And the word of God is telling you, don't be weary in well-doing and raising your children. Don't be afraid to be strong and say things that need to be said to keep your children in line. But understand this, that when you do this, you are honoring me. And if you're honoring me, then I will honor you as a parent. And I will touch your children. And the children that you are raising, they will come to know me in such a way. You might not see it right now, they might say they believe and so forth. But there's a future ahead of them. And it's a future of blessings and hope that he wants to pour out upon the children that you are raising. And he will not let them go because they are your children. Amen. And he has heard your prayers. And he is answering those prayers. And he's saying, I will protect them. I will keep them safe. I will bring them into the river of life and they will learn to drink of me. And when they are old, they will not depart, but they will remember the touch from heaven and the touch from their parents upon them. In Jesus' name. And I have a word for you older people. For with some of y'all, you think that your light is going out. You don't understand that your light is just starting. Your illumination to those around you Understand that I supply the oil, saith the Lord. You don't have to go find it. You just have to come and sit with me. I will refill you and I will recharge you. And I know that you are looking around and you're seeing and you're saying, what, 
what use am I at this hour? But you don't know the people that know you. And I will exalt you in due season, and they will see the light that's on you and in you. And you will restore their souls. You will give them hope. And many prodigals will return because of you. So don't be weary in well-doing. Do season you too shall reap. Then I have a word this morning for people that have problems in their body. If you've got an area you can lay your hand on, go ahead and do it. And Father, I just speak right now, Lord, over all of those that are having physical stuff in their bodies right now. And the word that I believe God has given me for you is the word I preached this morning. Go to the cross. Cry out, not for your healing or your touch, but cry out, broaden my borders, Lord, to encompass the cross. I don't want to just know that it was for me. I want the benefits that are for me. For these benefits is a witness for you. So I lift them up to you right now and I just speak the benefits of the cross, the benefits of that whip, the benefits of the crown of thorns, to come over them and touch them in Jesus' mighty name. So Lord, we give you the thanks and praise this morning. I thank you for these people, wonderful Christians. I love them all. But you love them with an exceeding great love. And you're drawing them unto yourself by your loving kindness. So I pray for them and intercede for them that every need will be met in their lives. In Jesus' name, amen.